should I pin this one? Ça a l'air de marcher. Okay, thank you everyone. So for this uh, last lecture, we start by giving you references. So here I mentioned two books to learn about the theory of free probability. There is the first one, which is very abstract, and you can pick a lot of materials independently in different chapters on it. I love this book, uh, but there is not a lot of connection with random matrices that you will find in a second book. So Speicher uh, is a contributor of, uh, two, of these two books, so it is, there is really a, a good uh, continuation. So here you will find a lot of uh, methods, the method of uh, subordination, amalgamation, a lot of things that are useful if you really want to compute spectra with your computer in particular. So the things that you won't find specifically there, there it will be the theory, the combinatorics, if you like it. Uh, about what is more specific to what I told you uh, during this lecture is uh, the theory of traffics that I, I have written a monograph about the subject. So here there is a, a first introduction. It's called Traffic Distribution and Independence, it's the first uh, volume. There is also a second volume with uh, two other authors, Sebron and Dalgvist, that you can uh, read to go further uh, into other aspects. But for the uh, content of this lecture, today I will talk about freeness over the diagonal. And this connection with traffic uh, independence is made uh, in an article with uh, several authors, which is uh, the team of traffic uh, guys, uh, Benson O, Guillaume Sebron, Antoine Davis, and Fran Gabriel. So it's a short article where there is not a lot of uh, theory about traffic. We focus on this result of uh, matrices showing uh, numerical applications of how it works. And then the continuation of this uh, uh, aspect of this relationship, we develop it uh, with uh, Jeremy Bigot for uh, the question of uh, finding uh, the spectrum of variance profile matrices and finding the outliers for covariance matrices or for emission matrices. So here again, it will be more about the, the numerics and really the mathematical aspects of uh, matrices rather than traffic themselves. Okay. So do you have questions about the last lecture? If not, let me just uh, remember uh, what we, we did. In the second section, I was uh, starting uh, talking about these weird ensembles for which we need more uh, techniques than the ones that uh, free probability offers. I gave uh, a proof which was a bit technical uh, that shows a convergence of uh, traces for products of permutation invariant matrices. Uh, it involves a lot of uh, techniques, including graphs. So as you can feel, the price you have to pay, the investment you have to pay to understand this is quite high. So I won't uh, focus really on this, uh, on this aspect. We will try to, to move this complicated combinatorial result into something which is analytic. And especially yesterday with Mark Potter, you discover that for the classical cases of, uh, of um, Gaussian matrices, there exist fixed point equations uh, called the subordination property in the case of the sum involving the Stilges transform, the R transform, S transform, T transform, all these Voiculescu transforms that Voiculescu defined 40 years ago and that we use intensively today to compute spectrum. What we will do today, after a, a remark on balance profile matrices, is to turn this uh, analytical theory to a higher level, which is the level over the diagonal, uh, a theory that also has been constructed by Voiculescu 40 years ago, but that has been applied recently for this weird ensemble. So the equation you have met of the subordination property, this fixed point equation, will meet the same equation, but for slightly different objects. And on changing a little bit this definition will change the algorithm somehow. It will be more uh, consuming in terms of uh, computational resources, but it will give a good solution computing spectra of these weird ensembles. Okay, so this is uh, the program, and uh, let's start. But first, 
I have to talk about the second kind of uh, weird ensemble I want to consider. It will be quite short and just to show you that the uh, tools that we introduce with the trace of test graphs turns out this problem very easily from the moment point of view. It doesn't tell us that we will uh, have uh, obviously a nice solution to uh, an analytic solution to compute the spectra, but at the level of combinatorics and moments, this is quite trivial. Let me be more explicit. Assume that we are given a matrix HN that can be written as an Adamar product, an entry wise product of two matrices, but these two matrices does not play a symmetric role. One matrix is like your favorite random matrix you're studying the spectrum, like a GUE matrix or a Bernoulli matrix if you need sparsity. On the other guy, I will call it gamma n, and I'm doing the entry-wise product. This guy is, is a variance profile, or just a profile function. Let's say a deterministic function. And for instance, you, you take a shape like this, and you decide that you put a zero here and one here, okay? So what you're doing is you're taking your matrix and you're erasing, you're taking your random matrix. And if you do this on wise product, you're erasing a part of the matrix. We assume that this variance profile is macroscopic. Ah, oui. Should I start again? <laughs> okay. We assume that this guy is macroscopic. Example, and it is not uh, restricted to this example, but let's look at this. We fix a function f, a measurable function, from 0, 1 square to, let's say, c. And we set gamma n. It will be a n by n matrix whose entry aj is this function that we sample at the point i over n, j over n. OK? So I draw this picture. You can model this by a function, the indicator function of an ensemble on the square. And then you just discretize your matrix and take this value. Of course, because there is this discretization, we will assume that this function is at least continuous by path. If you have a measurable function, there is a way to invent a relevant profile where we're we not taking uh, uh, pointwise as a value because it doesn't make really sense for a measurable function, but let's look at this, okay? You can also take a variance profile, gamma n, which will be a random matrix. Another example would be to take gamma n random, but independent of xn, and for instance, is one with probability alpha and zero otherwise. So you're just uh, destroying randomly the entries of your matrix. Okay. So just let me write something which will be just a little lemma that will uh, end this section that tells us how to understand the moments of uh, Hn in terms of Xn and gamma n. Remember that we define the trace of a test graph, a tau n of t in Hn called trace of uh, test graphs. And if you don't care about uh, all the test graphs, you can focus on these simple cycles. This is just a way to encode the moment. And if you want to compute something more general than moment, like Adamar products, you see that you can uh, cook the good test graph to do that. But even for T, which is a cycle, this is interesting to have this approach. Let me maybe recall the definition of this guy. If uh, this is the morning, we need to refresh a little bit uh, what we have seen before. 
of, uh, so there is a single matrix, let's say. What does that mean? So it's, a, it's represent an expectation of a normalized trace, but it's a bit, a bit more general. If you have an arbitrary uh, graph like this, you have the set of vertices for which for each vertex, you choose an index. Your test graph encode matrices on the edges. Let's say we have a single uh, matrix. So you, you put the same matrix on each edge, okay? And then given these uh, indices, you make the product of the matrix entries that correspond to each edge, which is represented like this in a, in a short way. Phi of E, E is a uh, tuple, and this means phi of W, phi of V. Okay. Traffic theory tells you that there is a decomposition of this quantity as a finite sum. And this finite sum is uh, organized thanks to the, partition, the partitions of the vertex set. And there, another functional called the injective trace, denoted with this little uh, nut, apply on what is called the quotient graph of T, obtained by identifying vertices in the same block of pi. Okay, good. And this guy has actually very good properties when you compute it for a classical model of matrices. The limit of this guy is either zero, either uh, something non-zero when T has a specific geometric or combinatorial form, like being a double tree, being a cactus, depending on the model. Okay, so it's quite nice. And it's also quite nice to see what is traffic independence because the formula is a product when it's non-zero. Okay, and what about variance profile? Well, it will be quite uh, trivial. In presence of permutation invariant matrices. Uh, maybe I should uh, add one other, recall another uh, definition that we involved that was involved in uh, the proof uh, two days ago. It, I called it a delta n0. It's just a different normalization of this two n0. Let me write explicitly the definition. It's the expectation of the product, the same product here. We fix a single matrix. I put phi of e as a shortcut for this. Uh, a little technical problem. Is it okay online? No one die. No one die. And here there is a phi. And for phi, it is a given injective map. So let's put a t pi to be consistent. We are talking about this guy. Injective. And so if HN is permutation invariant, when you're summing over phi injective, the expectation you, are not, uh, you have a quantity which does not depend on phi. And so we just see that this guy is just a renormalization of this guy, right? And this guy is just a product of matrix entries, the expectation of a product of matrix entries. Okay. So let Hn equals to gamma n times uh, Xn. Assume that the matrices are independent. Xn is permutation invariant. Assume that the entries are bounded or bounded in moments. Or assume that the quantities I'm going to write uh, make sense, these quantities. Then, if you want to compute the injective trace of Hn, and you want to do that if you use this formalism, as you see, because of uh, this formula, it is quite simple. It is 
what I call the injective density, because it's a small quantity on the variance profile time the injective trace of the original matrix. And of course, I forget something uh, doesn't make sense. This is for any test graph, or let's say any quotient graph if you start from a computation like this. Sorry for the mistake. So you fix a graph, you want to compute the injective trace in the matrix of interest, Hn. Actually, it is just a product of the injective density of this test graph in the variance profile times the injective trace of this test graph in the permutation invariant matrix. Conclusion is that, again, we have a simple formula which just involves a product. Why this is true? But let's look at the definition of this guy. Uh, let me not write uh, everything. We look at the definition of this guy. Here's the expectation I can, as before, put it here. But here, Hn is the entry-wise product of a gamma n under Xn. Okay, so I can just write this product as the product of gamma n of phi of E times Xn of phi of E. I can also write a product over this times a product over this. Then I assume that the two matrices are independent. So I can just split my expectation. Product of uh, Xn of phi of E. But Xn is permutation invariant. So it does not depend on phi. So this phi and this phi, you can put a phi tilde, which is another uh, injective map uh, fixed. Uh, where I am? Oh, I start from the expression of the trace. I should have uh, start from the beginning, working on the injective trace of the quotient graph. Sorry, is injective, and here it is a quotient graph. Okay. So doing so, you factorize this term and you rearrange them and you just get this formula. This is just uh, because you have the, just you, you're, you're considering the expectation of products and entries. And of course, you can factorize that. Where fighting is any injective guy. Not especially this guy, so you can put this outside, okay? And you can rearrange, of course, you have the sum on this guy, but um, okay, maybe I should. Uh, I did not. I defined this for permutation invariant model, but I should say that when you have your variance profile, I was uh, confused about this definition. It's not exactly this when the matrix is not, uh, so this works for Xn. Yeah, 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 there is a summation, but I will write something different than the summation. It will be the same, huh? but I will say that it is the same quantity like this, but where phi is a random, uh, injective map, uniform. So just a replacement of the sum. Random uniform. But being random uniform, you know, it's just uh, doing a sum, normalizing well by dividing by the number of elements. But if you balance this with what you get from the, the other term, you will get this formula. Okay. Which the conclusion is that if you want to understand the variance profile matrix, from the point of view of the injective trace, you will have something which is quite immediate to factorize. It doesn't mean that your distribution is easy to compute because first, this method allows you to compute moments, which is just uh, one way to understand the distribution, which is quite obscure, quite uh, algebraic. 
And even this moment will be, you will have a summation because you want to compute a moment, uh, you have the sum over the partition of terms that factorize. So from the combinatorics point of view, it is easy, but it doesn't tell you that you will have a, a nice spectrum and a nice method to compute it, okay? But in the context of uh, asymptotic traffic independence, I won't go back to the techniques of that. It means that if you have a family, uh, independent families of permutation matrices as two days ago, but for each matrix, you put a variance profile. The formula that uh, I show you involving the graph of color red components still hold, but with a prefactor. We will, have, we will factorize some terms due to the variance profile. So the phenomenon that the, uh, the structure of three of trees rules the asymptotic of the moments, of the injective moments, still be true. But just you will have a factor which depends on your variance profile. Okay, again, I'm not going to the details about this, but it is important just to see that uh, it doesn't really modify what happened in this topic, in this uh, context. And the computation we were able to do for pure permutation invariant matrices is still valid when we put a variance profile. Just notice that if you have a permutation invariant matrix and you put a variance profile, you no longer have a permutation invariant matrix. Imagine you, your variance profile is like this. Of course, you, you are breaking this. You're breaking the permutation invariance, but you're not breaking the method. Okay. Yes. Uh huh. Then you get so you get permutation there, and then delta is equal to tau. Or no, 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 no. Is uh, sorry for uh, not being very uh, precise about this. Is a matrix uh, if uh, how to say that? If a matrix is permutation invariant, this delta n zero is just this expectation for a chosen phi. If, if, if not, you must uh, sum over all phi and divide by the number of injective map, which is equivalent to take a, your random uniform injective map, okay? But what is always true, if you take this more general definition, is that the injective trace in a graph, let me put it pi, is always just the, the the relation between these two quantities is always just a question of normalization. And this is always true. So we compute it, it's uh, n factorial over n minus uh, v pi factorial. So this is always true. This is why I call it this injective trace and the injective density because it's just a uh, normalization. Is, uh, is it answering your question? No, no, it's any matrix. But if it is not permutation invariant, the definition of these deltas N0 must be this one. You must average on all your matrix. If it is permutation invariant, by just choosing in your matrix, if you have a, a, a test graph of size three, you will have just to consider a, a, a sub matrix of, of size three. You compute your expectation involving this little. Uh, part of your matrix, computing this, but permutation invariance tells you that actually this is the same thing as if you were doing this computation in all the matrices. Let me comment a little bit this. How do we compute that? Um, imagine you have such a test graph. You choose uniformly at random, uh, You have three vertices, so you choose. Uh, okay, I will, I'm going to be confused about this. Uh, so, A, J, K. So, what does that mean? You choose a J, you choose an A, you choose a K uniformly at random. It will give you the matrix entries somewhere. And you compute the product of these random variables. Okay. For a given A, J, K, you're just choosing three entries. 
But then you average over all the matrix, picking a lot of information on the matrix. Is it the test graph or the Here, this is there the same object. Uh, the test graph is the test graph, and then you can take the quotient of the test graph, you will get the test graph. Just the point is that usually you start computing a moment, then you model in your T, and the first step is to write as a sum of quotient graphs. So the quotient appears as an expansion of a trace. So we got in the, in the thing, in the combinatory, but you can start with a test graph with repetition there. But if there is no repetition there, there will be repetition there. But the nature of the object is the same on the right hand side and on the left hand side in general. Of course, I start by considering very specific objects for T, like these cycles or the double cycles like this. But it was just a, a choice uh, for the presentation. OK, so this is just a way to pick information in your matrix. Imagine you have your graph, you put your graph in your uh, matrix and you average. And by putting your graph in your matrix, I just mean you compute this. OK. So this was just to mention that uh, these variance profile matrices can be handled with this injective trace. So let's stop talking about this uh, injective stuff and combinatorial aspect and start again with the classical theory of uh, free probability at the level of, uh, of amalgamation, which is a the analog of conditional expectation and introduce the notion of freeness over the diagonal. Okay, so I recall you that a non commutative probability space is the data of a couple A phi, where A is an algebra, phi is a linear map playing the role of the expectation. You should also consider a star if you want to do. Uh, things properly, but it will not be uh, mandatory for the presentation today. So I will uh, introduce what is a conditional expectation in terms of uh, this non commutative language. And then what is freeness respective to this conditional expectation. But for the moment, I did not give you the definition of freeness uh, just for fine. If I, uh, so I will start by giving this definition and then adapt it at the level of the conditional expectation. And maybe you will be surprised by the definition of freeness because it's not uh, very uh, similar to the definition of independence. So we will take time uh, first uh, about this. So you consider A1, AL, which are subalgebras of A. In classical theory, you define the independence of sigma fields, right? And random variables are independent if the sigma fields they generate are independent. This is the same. We define the thing for algebras, and different families of non commutative random variable will be free if the, the algebras they generate are free. So let's talk about this algebra. We say that they are free, and in the classical basic sense of Reculescu, if and if we have this uh, property. Now let me be very precise. For all integer n, for all indices L1, L2, up to Ln, so indices that appear, that choose one or another algebra, but you choose that the first algebra is not the second one, and the second algebra is not the third one, but the third one may be the first one. We say that we take an alternating sequence of indices up to L. So this guy, I told you, they, are, they correspond to algebra, so they are indices in L. Now, for each algebra on this step, you consider an element in this algebra. For all A1 in the first algebra, 
AL in the last algebra. Okay. Such that these guys, these n variables, are centered. Phi of a j is zero for all j. Then the product of this variable, and because it's non-commutative, you must specify an order, is centered. Is there any mistake or? Yeah, thank you. Equals zero. And in words, we say that an alternating, alternating, alternating refers to this property, product of centered elements. So these guys are my, my centered elements, are centered. My product has expectation zero. So it's not the expectation of the product, it's the product of the expectation, but the alternating product of centered elements is centered. That's it. And if it is the first time you discover what is freeness, you should be a bit uh, confused. But remember how you were confused the first time we defined in classical independence in little school. It's the same thing. Why this is a good universal rule? should be developed in a proper lecture. How we can compute uh, a moment with that? It's not obvious, maybe I should mention that. Let's say that I take uh, different elements in A1, AL, and I want to compute the expectation of their product. If I'm not in the situation where it is an alternative product, I'm, I must work on this uh, formula because I have no, no direct rule about that. So if I want to compute uh, for, an arbitrary guy in the algebra generated by this guy, I can assume that uh, by linearity, it is a product, A, 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 L. I can organize my term in such a way I have alternating products. So that uh, we have this property. And so I repeat. If you take a monomial, which is a product of element of this, you can just organize the product to regroup the guy in the same algebra. Okay, and then write it like this. If I'm able to compute the expectation of A for any guy of this form, by linearity, I'm able to compute phi on the algebra generated by this guy. And this is knowing the joint law of this, uh, the element of this algebra. Okay, this rule doesn't tell me directly how to compute this guy because I cannot assume in general that my guy are centered. So how can I do to compute phi of A? Then I, um, artificially, I start writing the quantity that is involved here by removing for each term the expectation. And this expression, if I stop it, obviously it's not correct because I modify it. So I expand these terms to have a nice uh, expression plus other terms. What are the other terms? This guy is actually, there is no. So this guy is phi of these guys times the second guys times the other guy. We have this term, this is the one we know. So the other term are the one we obtain by removing all the other expansions. Like if I choose first to factorize minus phi of A and an arbitrary way the other one, it will be another term that I will have to remove, okay? Then this guy is zero by freeness because I just made things in such a way I have an alternating product of, alternative, of centroid elements. And then by induction, I do the same trick to compute my terms here. 
it can be a long process, of course, because it is by induction. And it explains that computing uh, moments in non-commutative probability needs some, uh, some techniques because there is no direct method. OK? OK, so now we can consider what is a conditional expectation. Yes? Yeah, so this is a moment approach. And in classical probability, you know, you can use the expectation or the characteristic function, which has very nice properties. Then I'm not really mentioned it, but there is the cumulant approach, which involves the subject mentioned by Jean, which has the non crossing partitions and which is related to the schwinger dyson formula we have proved for Gaussian matrices in the first lectures. Okay, so there is another way to translate what is uh, freeness and based on these objects. It would require uh, half an hour more to, to develop this. Okay, so let's uh, skip that and talk about freeness over the diagram. So now we are considering uh, a space, which is a little uh, bit uh, richer. We now assume that we have an operator valued probability space, that is a triple A, B, and delta, where B is a subalgebra of A and delta is a linear map from A to B. And we assume that it is a non commutative conditional expectation in the following sense that should be, uh, that should, okay, let's look at this such that the delta of B1 A B2 is B1 delta A B2 for all A in A and little b's in B. So what is a classical definition of the conditional expectation? You have the expectation of a product of X, Y conditionally on X, and you can factorize one of these variables the one you, which goes outside the filter. Here, it is non-commutative. So you do the same thing, but on two sides. Okay? It looks just formal, but it works very well. Is it clear? Which example we will consider of non-commutative probability space uh, operator valued? We will take. As usual, for the algebra, we take uh, matrices or random matrices, but let uh, me write the deterministic setting. For Bn, we will take the diagonal matrices, what I call the again of C. And for delta, we take the linear map that, given the matrix A, associate the diagonal matrix of the diagonal element of A, okay? There are other uh, structures and matrices which are very interesting and useful in practice. But today, for this weird ensemble, this is the one we want to consider, okay? So just a definition, uh, a bit abstract of a structure, but we can adapt the notion of freeness. <laughs> And we say that subalgebras of this guy A are free uh, over, over B, or free with amalgamation over B, but I prefer the shortcut. If only if I have these properties, where now I take my families uh, AJ in the algebra generated by the, the good algebra I want as before, but also I include Bs. 
the operators that play the role of scalars. Such that they are centered, but not for the trace, for the, for the conditional expectation. Then the conditional expectation of the product is zero. What is important to understand is that formally, and for uh, let's write it there because it is where it is important. Formally, we make the following replacement. We replace the complex numbers by diagonal matrices. And we replace the normalized trace by this diagonal operator. And if you make this translation at this level, so I have written uh, with a phi instead of the normalized trace, because the asymptotic finesse is just asymptotic, I need the limit. But if you made the replacement, you see that it is how is defined freeness with some dimension. Just by replacing here, we add to the complex numbers the B, and by replacing the trace by the delta. So this means that the matrix AJ has zero in the diagonal. The diagonal is zero. Ah. Okay. That's ab absolutely. Which is weird. Why is it interesting? But it works. So it gives you algorithm at the end, so you don't be so picky. Okay. Um, okay. So it's almost the end. Um, this part was quite technical, and I think that if I come back to that to justify uh, to justify that the relation, it will be painful for everyone. Just let me sketch a proof that uh, traffic independence implies freeness over the diagonal. And then I will answer your, your question if you have a moment. I want to prove that if I have permutation in one matrices, I have this relation under this assumption. What we know is a technique to compute the trace of a product that involves this complicated graph of component, component uh, or connected components, right? Okay, let's try to imagine what happened. Take an expression like this. It is a moment, well, it is a product that I represent with a cycle like this. And I have several colors. Let's say we have two families and so talk two colors. If I find this. Okay. So this represents a group of edges in an algebra, a group of edges in the other algebra, and so on. We were considering matrices A1 and A2, remember? So let's say it is a power of A1, a power of A2, and so on. If you just compute the trace of a power, let me just sketch the proof that uh, this phi is zero. It's not, it's not showing that the delta is zero, but it will, be, um, it will contain uh, all the ingredients. So let's, uh, if we want to compute the phi, we compute the tau of this guy, and we knew that it is a sum over pi of the injective trace. And here, it is uh, up to a small error, the indicator function of uh, an event, which is that the quotient graph has a tree, a tree structure. The graph of colored component is a tree, but it's ruled, ruled by trees. Ruled by trees. Okay, and let me not be more specific. Now, if instead of just taking the trace of a product, I take the trace of products where I remove the diagonal, let's call the V1, V2, V3, and so on, these uh, vertices at the junction between two segments like this. Removing the delta, you're considering not only a product, but uh, it will be a linear combination, which should be complicated in general, because uh, as I told you, we compute things for moments. And so if you have a polynomial, you should go for every monomial and have a linear combination. It should be more complicated. But because you remove the diagonal, it turns out that it actually simplifies this formula. 
And here, this is an equality. You have the same equality, but we have a restriction. It won't be the sum for all permutation, but all permutation such that two adjacent vertices are never identified. Partition. Okay, so again, we have not just a monomial, but a linear combination, but by some uh, good properties, this actually simplifies things instead of uh, complexifying it. Okay, but now if you have a tree, uh, a tree has branches and it has leaves. Okay, this is uh, very simple. So we should check on the combinatorics, but for the uh, graph structure uh, of tree, this means that if I take a branch of this, to get a quotient which gives whose graph of colorate component is a tree, we can see that at some point, I must identify one V1 and one VI with one VI plus one. Because you, this graph of color and component make, I'm making a, an arbitrary graph, a subgraph like this, and I have a graph structure, a tree structure. So somehow this condition of uh, being uh, a tree for the level of the graph of color red component is incompatible with the uh, uh, condition we add by removing the delta. Okay, so this is a sketch of proof that just try to convince you that phi is zero. And once you have this technique, you can prove that uh, at some point, uh, on some level, actually the diagonal is zero, not only the trace, but uh, any, all the entries. Okay, so this is the end of the first uh, part of the lecture, if I'm correct. We have a short break. So, just later, we'll see equation. We forget about this combinatorics and turn this uh, um, formal notion of uh, freeness over the diagonal into something analytic. Thank you. And you have questions, so you can probably answer it right now. Yes. What does that mean? Uh, so the, the question is to specify what does that mean this right yeah especially the line right below there those ajs can be also so this aj also let's say that uh, assume that aj is just the algebra generated by a single element just to simplify what means being in the algebra generated by a and b it means that being of the form B0, A, B1, A, B, N, A, B, N plus one. For some B0, B, N plus one, and for some N. Okay. And you complexify because B is non-commuting with A. If B is just uh, the algebra of complex numbers, you can just factorize all the B and say it is, will be proportional to a power of uh, A. But now you have to intercalate some bees like this. And so you have to, to, be, to ensure that you, you're taking an element of this form or linear combination maybe, such that the diagonal of this guy is zero. Of course, I'm saying diagonal, but in the abstract setting, it's not uh, the diagonal. It's just, uh, you, you must find a way to approximate uh, diagonal matrices like this, which is tricky and technical. Huh? I'm avoiding a lot of, uh, of problems. Uh, is it more clear? Other questions? Okay, if not, uh, let's have a break. Thank you. Other question nine, maybe? I should check. I don't think so. No, no. Ou bah c'est le matin, les gens ils sont tranquilles, ils dorment un peu. Ah oui, j'aurais dû excuser.